Back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite. And we have a commitment for you guys. Uh, we have the second commitment <laughs> from the class of 2025. We told you these commits would probably start rolling in. And uh, here we are, February 6th. We have our second of the class, Talibi Kaba. He is an athlete out of Hillside High School. He's listed at 6'2", 203. We played a lot of uh, running back in high school. Uh, tell us about this kid and what position you, do you really expect him to come in and actually play? So yeah, Tawibi Kaba, 6'2", 203 guy. Um, those are legit weight and height and weight from last year's Rivals camp. Um, he actually came to the combine, didn't get a camp invite, didn't have any offers last year at this time. Um, he got a uh, came to the combine and tested really well, ran a 4'6 laser at a 40-yard dash, which is was huge. We saw that in right coach. <laughs> Shit, that's, maybe that's get that kid for in a guy mind. who might play linebacker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, like you just said, he's probably a linebacker or safety at the next level. Um, Rutgers is weird in that aspect where you can kind of have that little more towards the box type safety. I shouldn't say weird; it's just a different type of safety that they have. Um, we've seen guys like I want to say Igbenosin kind of fits that role a little bit because he's got yeah. that same size and height. Um, we've seen Christian Izian who didn't have that size and height play more towards the line of scrimmage. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this kid seems like uh, more of a safety linebacker type. His main recruiter is Drew Lascari, so that kind of tells you everything. Um, they'll probably take him as a safety because he's a little bit on the leaner side at 203. Um, obviously, he's gained weight since there, since he wasted himself at 215. So it, it is what it is. That doesn't really make a huge difference. Um, but, but a pretty good get. This is a kid that um, I think last year at this time only had an Iowa State offer. And then Duke came in, offered Boston College. Miami showed some interest. Um, I believe Miami actually had a couple coaches up to his school recently. So did West Virginia. So did a bunch of others. Um, and then Rutgers um, hosted him on an unofficial visit for one of the bowl practices this uh, past December. So I'm on an official visit. Boom, offer done. And uh, he came on a junior day visit. I want to say, what was it, last Wednesday? Wednesday before that? Last Wednesday. Um, and that, that kind of sealed the deal. After that, you uh, you saw in our war room on Friday. He said that Rutgers is his number one, uh, without a doubt. Loved the visit, loved everything about it. And uh, here we are a couple days later and commitment. Yeah, so I'm seeing he got his offer on December 14th, and he's committing on February 6th. So he's only had that offer for about six weeks, and yeah. it's a pretty quick turnaround. Most of these kids will have that offer for, for several months to you know, over a year before they commit. Um, mm -hmm. Was it just that he was blown away with Rutgers and it was kind of a no-brainer for him? Uh, hometown kid, uh, loves Jersey, loves everything about it. Um, hillside kid out of Newark. Uh, yeah, he kind of just went on the visit. He said he spent a lot of time with, uh, Shiano, Harris Simiak and Lascari and just kind of really built that relationship up quite a bit in that first visit or second visit, uh, to campus. And, uh, he just really liked everything about it. And that was it kind of sealed the deal right there. Um, Jersey kid through and through, like I said, and just loves, loves the state. Now he can get his teammate to join him. Whew. I was going to say there's a couple connections to this kid that might be you know huge for Rutgers uh, to help fill out the rest of this class. So let's start with this teammate, uh, strong side defensive end, Darren Akinagbong. Uh, he's listed at 6'5", 240. This is a kid who's top 10 in the state, has a mm -hmm. ton of offers. Tell us about this kid. Yeah, he's had um, just about every school come to see him this spring. Um, Georgia came up, Notre Dame came up, Florida, uh, West Virginia, like I mentioned before. Um, uh, Penn State came over. Uh, a bunch of different schools came to see him at Hillside, and it's it's uh it's not a school that's traveled to uh that much because um they don't really produce as much as they they like to, but they're starting to now. Um, if you remember, I think the last Power Five guy was Brian Ugu, uh, who yep. I think is actually an NFL draft prospect right now. He is. So he had eight sacks this past year for Miami of Ohio. PFF mm -hmm. lists him in, in one of their, uh, as one of their top 250 prospects for the upcoming wow. draft. So he's probably going to get drafted. Good he's had a, a nice breakout uh, in his second uh, mm -hmm. stint in college football. Um, unfortunately, guys like that, <clears throat> you know, will develop and, you know, flourish elsewhere sometimes. And you, you never wish bad for that, but it sucks mm -hmm. when you know, you go, always use an extra pass rusher and seeing when your own guys have success elsewhere. Him and yeah. Jimmy Kroma, uh, the guy from J JMU. Yeah. JMU, uh, him, he had 10 plus sacks this past year, but uh, you, you're talking about a lot of schools visiting these guys at Hillside. Mm -hmm. Hillside was, I think, the first school that the two new defensive line coaches Correct. went to see when they got mm -hmm. hired. So both uh, Campenny and Farrell were at Hillside the next day after they got announced. So this was a priority. Yeah kid for them uh 
It seems like a Kinnick Kinnick bomb. We'll have to get the pronunciation of his name because it's a lot of letters. Um, Top one. But both both these guys seem to be priority recruits, so it's it's good to get a teammate of one of your top uh, targets. Um, how how are you uh, hearing Rutgers is doing with this kid? Uh, yeah, that one's going to be an extremely tough one to win. Um, like I said before, he's got every SEC offer in the book right now, and and I shouldn't just say SEC. He just got Ohio State. A couple days ago, he got Notre Dame, I think, a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, he just visited Georgia this past weekend. Um, and, I mean, if you're visiting Georgia not on a camp visit, that kind of tells you all you need to know. If you have an offer and it's not on a camp offer or not camp visit, um, it kind of tells you that they're very serious about you. Uh, I know after talking to our Georgia guys, they think that um, there's a real chance he ends up at Georgia. So something to keep an eye on. But uh this is a kid, if you can somehow manage to keep home, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, so huge target recruit, obviously number nine ranked kid in the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's also another connection here with another top 15 kid in the state. Tell us about the connection here with West Orange High School. Yes, so Terrell Wilfong, Wilfong is a wide receiver, high three-star top 15 kid, I think, uh, in state. He, his head coach at West Orange is the brother of Hillside's head coach. Um, they're both the Grant brothers. Um, they kind of run that little section of Jersey, I guess if you want to say that. Um, they, uh, they're both great coaches. They're both great talent developers. Um, it's, it's just a, another little connection that um, Rutgers has there. But looking back at that Hillside photo that you mentioned before, that Farrell and Campeni were both there. But they also had Lascari, Shiano, and Harasimiak all in one day visit the same school which tells you they were very serious about Kaba, very serious about a King of Bong, um, and just very serious about recruiting Hillside in the future too, because I'm, I'm sure they have a couple guys down the line that will end up being uh, pretty big dudes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Rutgers has targeted kids from West Orange for years. And, you know, I, I remember there was, a, I think, a linebacker from back in the day who uh, flood recruited um, comes to mind. Uh, was it Sydney Goper? Is that his name? Gopri, Gopri, Gopri. I don't know. One of those three. Uh, but yeah, it's it's always got a ton of talent there. So another great uh great school to have a connection with. Um, is there anything else about uh you know Talibi Kaba that was noteworthy that you wanted to hit on before we we move on to some other news that we have uh, developing um, possibly? No, I mean I'm I'm looking now. If you watch his tape, you're going to see a ton of running back stuff and. It is what it is, so I think it's going to be hard to evaluate him correctly because obviously I don't. He's not going to be a running back at the next level. Uh, he runs way too upright, and he just doesn't have that that juke or not, not even juke that elusiveness. I guess I'll use the term. Um, he he just seems like a, a really good athlete that you could develop into a solid linebacker down the line. Uh, I just wish there was more linebacker tape on him. But yeah. going forward, I'd probably expect him to go out to a couple camps, couple and perform as a linebacker. So we'll kind of wait and see what uh what he can do this uh this off season. There's the uh, camp season, I should say. Awesome. So more to come on him. I'm sure there'll be plenty more on the message board and mm-hmm. in upcoming pods. But just wanted to give you the news we got uh, about Tilly Kaba. Yeah, I'd say top but, twenty, top twenty five, maybe. Yeah, I think so. By by the time things are all said and done, he's got a, a lot of offers. Um, you were talking about off the pod about how rivals is kind of changing their philosophy on grading kids where they're mm-hmm. waiting till these cycles occur now. So you might not see a grade on him for the next few weeks, but it's coming. Trust us. Yeah. Once that cycle comes through, the new update comes through, I should say, uh, you'll see a uh, ranking for him. And I don't even think Sean Ashenfelder, the other 2025 commit, the quarterback has a ranking yet, but he should get one very soon. Awesome. Um, now let's yeah. talk a little bit about uh, some, some rumor mill that's going currently. Uh, so, uh, it sounds like one of Rutgers assistant coaches is he in the, the driver's seat or one of the finalists for an Ivy League head coaching job. A little bit about this situation. Yeah, so Harvard's head coach, uh, Tim something, I forget his last name. Tim Murphy. Um, Tim Murphy ended up uh, stepping down this year, won uh, part of the Ivy League, stepped down right after that. It's been 30 years as head coach of Harvard. Or uh, 30 years at Harvard? I forget. Yeah, he was One the head coach at Harvard for 30 years. Previously, yeah. he was the head coach at Cincinnati and Maine. So he's been a head coach uh, straight through since 1987. That is a hell of a resume and a hell of a way to go out by winning a share of the Ivy League title. Yep. Um, damn, that's crazy. 200 wins, 89 losses. That's a good record. That's uh, but yep. besides the point, 
they still haven't hired a replacement. Um, they are looking around, and apparently, Ivy League. Uh, I don't even know how to word that one. We're just going to say uh, Andrew Aldrich. We're just going to throw it out there. <laughs> is a serious candidate for the job, and arguably the favorite from what uh, we've heard as well. Well, we'll see how much that ends up happening or not because it's a weird role. Like I don't. I was thinking about this before. Is it really an upgrade? Is it a downgrade? I. Because it's a head coach spot, it's Ivy League, you've been there before, you know what you're doing. You probably want an Ivy League guy if you're Harvard, but I just don't know if you consider that an upgrade in coaching or downgrade. Like it's just a it's a weird move, but I, I kinda understand it too for a couple of reasons. But I don't know. Yeah. What, what, you think it's an upgrade? So I've gone back and forth on this. For the longest time it was a clear upgrade. You know, you're you might be going mm. down a level, but you're going way up in terms of your responsibilities. You're a head coach, and then I mean, you can maybe yeah. parlay that into another job. But I think mm. more and more you've seen these head coaches at the lower level take lower level jobs at bigger schools mm -hmm. because they see that as the clearer path upwards. I think it's kind of at this point like a choose your own adventure to progressing through the coaching uh, tree, I guess. I don't know. So I don't, yeah. I don't think it's as clear of a, um, a step up or a step down as it used to be. I think for Andy, maybe it's, you know, maybe this is what he wanted. Maybe he wanted to be a head coach. He's fine being a head coach mm -hmm. at an Ivy League. He's comfortable there. He's been, he was at you know, Princeton for a really long time. Um, maybe this is a good opportunity for him to possibly parlay this into a, you know, a, head, coach, a head coaching job at the, the G5. Really not mm -hmm. sure. But I wouldn't say it's a step down, but I do think the, the waters have gotten significantly muddier in recent years with NIL. And uh, just like all the things that have been, you know, heaped on to uh, college athletics in the last five years, the transfer portal is much harder to, mm -hmm. to deal with in a smaller school setting. Um, it's just tough to keep a team together. You used to be able to have these cycles mm -hmm. where, you know, every four years you could seriously consider yourself a, a conference title contender because, you know, you were having these super classes of, you know, redshirt juniors, seniors and super mm -hmm. seniors all coming back. But you're not getting those kids to come back anymore. Yeah, it's. I, I was thinking. Uh, I was gonna say to myself, or I was gonna say on the pod actually. I was like, uh, "Hey, like Ivy League, you don't have to worry about NIL or anything like that." And I'm like, mm, nah, "I don't know. Dartmouth just unionized their yeah, basketball team, yep. so <laughs> maybe not." But uh, he spent he spent probably the majority of his coaching career and uh, college career, I'll even say, because he is a Princeton alum. He coached Princeton running backs for one. Uh, actually, coached as assistant at Princeton for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight years, eight years of his uh, what is this? Eighteen-year coaching tenure. Um, so it's and then four years of college there too. It it makes a lot of sense to go to the Ivy League route. You're already associate head coach, a offensive coordinator, and O line coach at Princeton. So you've had every title at the Ivy League, but the head coaching spot. So I think this kind of makes a lot of sense. And I'm not gonna say it's a bad move for both. I actually think it might be a good move for both if it ends up happening. If it doesn't end up happening, it is what it is. I don't think he's a bad coach. I don't think he's a bad recruiter. I think he's an okay recruiter. Um, but the tight ends have struggled. Like, there's no secret about that. Um, but I, I wouldn't be mad either and be like, all right, that, that's a win-win for both. Like, you get a head coach. Maybe you do pretty good over there. Maybe I bring you back in a couple years as, like, an OC again or something, maybe a lower-level guy again, like tight ends. And maybe maybe you do you fix O-lines again. and. All of a sudden, I need an old line coach down the line when Flaherty retires. I don't know, but I wouldn't be mad. I think there's a lot of options out there, and I think I told you this. One of my first calls has to be Bobby Bentley, um, who is Chase Dodd's father, former USF uh, pass game coordinator, slash wide receivers, slash tight end, slash something else. Um, and he's the main guy that gave a recommendation to Shiano to hire Mark Orphy, who's been pretty damn good. So. And they all worked at South Carolina together too. He was there for a couple years as well. So, yeah, I'm sure that this job—that's my call. Yeah, I think the job will be more desirable than ever, uh, just given that you know, Shiano just got a one of his guys a coordinator job, potentially a head coaching job as well. Yeah, um, Rutgers is clearly a program on the up and up, and really any improvement from the tight end position is going to be a uh, an upgrade from what we've had because we've just gotten mm -hmm. so little out of the tight ends. If they show a pulse at all, you're going to be seen as a very competent coach. So I do think uh, it's it's a win-win for a lot of promising assistant coaching candidates. So stay tuned mm -hmm. because if 
Andy Arch does end up taking the, the Harvard job, we will have uh, the hot board out and kind of guide you through that process. But I, I do think it could work out uh, for the best for all parties involved, like you said. Um, Hear me out. I got a name. Go for it. John McNulty. Ah, uh, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, he's, this would be his third available. stint at Rutgers if he comes back. <laughs> Third stint in third different. Oh, I guess the first one was OC too, so it doesn't matter. But it'd be it'd be interesting. Alabama just did get a new staff and let him go. Where was he most recent? Okay, he's an analyst at, at Alabama. Alabama. Prior to that, he was the OC at, at Boston College. He was the tight end coach at Notre Dame for two years. Um, there you go. Did, any, did he coach any standouts? Did Notre Dame produce any uh, tight ends? I can't imagine Notre Dame not producing a tight end. I feel like that that goes hand in hand almost. Um, not sure, but he was at uh, he was with the Titans as a quarterback coach to Tampa Bay with Shiano, where he coached quarterbacks, of course. But um, that was his only tight ends job, I guess, right? That was uh, no, oh, it was the Chargers, the Chargers, who um, you know, had one of the best tight ends of all time. He coached under. Um, yeah, he really parlayed that one into something nice. No, actually, I don't. I'm looking at it. Uh, he did coach Michael Meyer his freshman year who was a second-round okay. pick of the Raiders last year. He coached, uh, if you remember, Tommy Tremble with one of the, mm -hmm. the best uh, tight end names of all time. He's uh, the third-round pick of the Panthers in 2021. Uh, he coached Cole Komet, who was Ooh. drafted in 2020. He's a second-round pick for the Bears. So he's had some guys mm -hmm. drafted. and uh, So I this would be a pretty good hire. He knows Greg. I'm just saying. This is, um, you know, this is all hypothetical, obviously, but... Yeah, this follows no. along with the path that Greg has taken with his hires, uh, especially this most recent go around mm -hmm. with uh, Kev Brock, Kirk Soraka. Yeah. Um, once you're so badly wrong with certain coaching searches, you, you learn some some lessons for sure. And one that I learned was mm -hmm. Greg's going to hire somebody who's probably got a direct connection with the guy. Um, and if he doesn't, yep. he got a strong ass recommendation from somebody like PJ Fleck or something like that. Um, yeah. It'd be last, interesting. Last, It'd be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, the last thing I got is we got a basketball game tonight. Uh, Rutgers is playing Maryland. Rutgers is a seven and a half point dog. Uh, you don't really have, you know, a ton to say. I think if if they played like the second half from the game against Michigan, I think they have a very good chance of winning this game. Maryland doesn't really scare me much. If you can get Jameer mm -hmm. Young frustrated and kind of out of the game, he's he's one of their only truly scary players. Uh, Jameer Young is one of the top guards in the country. I think he came in as a transfer yeah. from uh, Georgetown, if I remember correctly. I think it was Georgetown. Um, yeah, I think you're right. But very, very, very good guard. Uh, he's an undersized guy. He's only 6'1". Um, if, if we kind of give him the... Uh, the Bug McDaniel treatment that we had against Michigan, where we're just kind of like blitzing him every time he has the ball. Maybe mm -hmm. have a guy like Michael Davis follow him around um, and get passed off to you know, either Jeremiah Williams or Mwat Mag. I do think Rutgers can shut him mm -hmm. down, but that's, again, easier said than done. Yeah. So, but I do think I, you I shut him down. I don't team. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't either. I, I, my hope is that they started to figure out what playing together is like at the end of the, the game against Michigan and kind of <laughs> where Jeremiah nope. Williams fits into all that. But who knows? Mm -hmm. You really don't know. Yeah. Um, I will say that this is uh, – the spread has jumped actually already. It was 7.5 this morning. It's up to 8 now um, in favor of Maryland, of course. Uh, home team, I don't know. Maryland's such a weird team. Um, Kevin Willard does suck as a coach. I'll say that. Um, so maybe Pico can out coach him and do a couple things uh, to help his team a little bit and see what happens. Um, I would prefer some maybe nice high pick and pick and rolls with Derek Simpson and Cliff Amori. Uh, maybe even try that with Jeremiah Williams because it worked pretty damn well in the second half. So maybe just keep going to it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, we shall see. Um, really hoping they can uh, pull off the upset here because, like you said, they're depending on what book you're looking at, seven and a half or eight point underdog. Um, mm -hmm. I think they can win. Maybe it's just me being a homer, but I yeah, think, I think they can. I'm just not confident. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say I'm confident either. But you know, each time I, I think I give up on this team, they give me just enough to to stay uh, to stay hopeful. Um, and, and in this case, it's yeah. the uh, 
could these the last 12 minutes of the game be the offense we run? And, you know, could Jeremiah Williams continue to have as big of an impact that he had on uh, Saturday or Sunday, whenever the game against Michigan was, uh, the rest mm-hmm. of the season? I mean, we'll certainly see. Um, could they hit more than one three per half? We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I do have one more thing, actually. Um, ooh, I got a little giveaway. That's what I'm going to do. All right. Uh, this is an interesting one. So, uh, long story short, I've had this in the box for a couple months now, and I just I was gonna do a giveaway uh, a couple months ago, but I just never got around to it. And uh, here we are. We got this Rutgers gnome. Look at this guy <laughs> in the box. Team gnome Rutgers. Little fo- oh, I think there's a little football there. Yeah, a little football right there. Um, so yeah, we're gonna give this bad boy away. I don't know. Um, I forgot where I got it from. From Forever Collectibles in Edison, New Jersey. So there you go. Um, in order to enter, there's a couple things you have to do. Number one, you have to rate the pod. And if you give us less than five stars and talking to that guy that gave us one recently, go fuck yourself. Number two, so give us five stars and you are immediately eligible. Um, it doesn't matter what app you're on, whether it be Spotify, Apple. Um, I don't even know if YouTube does stars. I think it's just a like button, to be honest. Um, number two, shoot us a comment uh, below. Um, what should we make the comment? You got to make it something Rutgers related. Uh, F the NCAA. Ah, that's a tough one. Gnome. Gnome. M-E. Gnome. 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 Me. Me. So if you comment Gnome, uh, you'll be eligible to win the Gnome. Uh, I guess we'll run this for the next... Free one. Yeah, we'll run this for the next couple weeks, and then uh, we'll do the same winner uh, select I gotta have this sit at my desk and watch me for weeks. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll run the winning selection yeah. thing uh, in a couple weeks, and we'll ship out the gnome to you. Sure. Yeah. yeah I'm not, I swear it's not cursed or anything like that, but no, <laughs> it's just, it's uh, just a, it's a weird giveaway. Random gnome. Hey, man, I I found it and I thought it was cool. That's it. <laughs> it's it's Sticking neat. To my like, story. This is pretty. It's, this is a this is a cool thing. Like I, I would love to put this on my front lawn if I had one. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen one of those. So exactly, um, yeah. I, mean, I, I feel like you, you actually can't put it on your front lawn. It's so cool; it might get stolen. You got to be careful. Yeah, right? you got to, especially if you're in a within twenty oh. miles of Rutgers campus. Yeah, yeah, you're at risk. <laughs> um, Ugh. anyway. All right, everybody. That's it. Well, we thank you once again for listening. Uh, as we alluded to, if you uh, give us a review and include the phrase "know me," no uh, me. you'll be entered <laughs> into the contest. And we'll give this bad boy away in a couple weeks. But for me and Richie, yep. this has been another edition of the Nerd Report Podcast, signing off.